I've had the opportunity to uh, to cross the border a couple times over the last several years, and I find it particularly interesting to try to look at uh, common problems from these different perspectives. And you'll see I'm going to take you through sort of a U.S. perspective on thinking about financial incentives and a, a bit about what we've learned and where we are. And, and I find it particularly interesting in this era that U.S. health policy and what I'd like to think of as the rest of the OECD uh, policy is uh, striving to meet in the middle to some degree. And I think that there are lessons we can share with one another uh, coming from those opposite ends about um, what to expect. So I just want to start by um, framing the issue. Most healthcare systems rely on some combination of direct regulation, in some cases direct provision, uh, but also market forces to achieve access to health care, quality of care, and um, maintenance of affordability of the health care system. Um, even systems like the U.S. that rely much more heavily on market forces to attain these health policy goals, however, uh, find that because of inherent market failures in health care, most notably asymmetric information between patients and physicians and uh, other healthcare providers, that market forces don't really get us where we want to go, particularly when it comes to access and quality of care. So, um, so we'll often think about financial incentives as health policy tools for achieving what the market fails to deliver. And in fact, that's really how we use them in the U.S., um, you see a lot of different characterizations of the use of, uh, of incentives like pay for performance that has a very targeted uh, structure. Uh, some folks on the right think of those as being uh, extremely anti-market. Some folks on the left think of pay for performance as being extremely pro-market. Um, nonetheless, uh, Financial incentives are inherently part of the healthcare system. So let me just give you a little sense about where I'm going. I'm going to start with a few points of context. And because of the time limitation and the huge scope of the issues that we're going to discuss today, I'm going to go very quickly over sort of my big takeaway on what we know about using financial incentives to achieve health policy goals. Uh, and then uh, share with you the way I organize financial incentives, again, thinking, um, thinking about payment to providers as a tool for achieving specific health policy goals. You'll note that my spectrum looks backwards to you, uh, and perhaps I should have inverted it given that I'm here in Quebec today. Uh, but, um, but I think we can think about these issues, again, from the Canadian context um, very much similarly, but starting from a different point. And then I'm going to give you some examples of what's going on in the U.S. in terms of payment reform in particular, some ideas uh, that are being experimented with and implemented, uh, many of which have analogs here, and uh, tell you a little bit about what we're beginning to learn and what we're trying to achieve with a certain balance of financial incentives. So I, I just want to start, this is the entire session is about financial incentives. Um, I will be talking about financial incentives. Let me just make it clear that no one, no one here believes that these are the only way uh, to achieve health policy goals, or in many instances, the best way of achieving health policy goals. Uh, I'm really just talking about what we know about the use of, of incentives in the healthcare system. And so just as a, a little bit of a precursor, um, we shouldn't think about any of these policy mechanisms in isolation. Clearly, uh, a big message that I want to deliver through my presentation today is that context matters, implementation, execution matter. So um, a few things that I have learned about financial incentives in health policy, um, having studied them more or less for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, first of all, financial incentives really do matter. Despite what you might have heard, healthcare providers are firms and individuals, and uh, their economic behavior is not that different from other firms and individuals. And really the best, strongest findings we have on the extent to which financial incentives matter at the margin come from unintended experiments. <laughs> so, uh, for example, in the U.S., uh, we can look at the Medicare fee schedule, the way we pay doctors for services, uh, 
And we can find the distortions in the fee schedule by looking at patterns of utilization. Uh, physicians, hospitals, other ambulatory care providers pick up on these distortions very quickly, very effectively. Financial incentives just fundamentally move healthcare delivery. That is not to say that they determine every choice about patient care. Uh, it is not to say that any one physician is out there saying, well, if I were getting remunerated just a little bit more for that test, I might do it. Uh, but in fact, financial incentives set up the way we structure our healthcare system. They determine the way hospitals uh, choose to extend their service lines. And all of that plays out in utilization cost and quality. And uh, likewise, every method of paying physicians in hospitals will generate some unintended consequence. Uh, maybe it will be a relatively minor consequence, such as upcoding uh, in the hospital context, and maybe it will be a relatively major consequence. Uh, we've seen examples of pay for performance encouraging hospitals and surgeons to avoid certain high-risk patients. So these unintended consequences, uh, we spend a lot of time, economists spend a lot of time thinking about them theoretically. Uh, there, there's good empirical evidence that they play out in the real world, but it's important to keep in mind that the existence of an unintended adverse consequence does not mean that we shouldn't be going down that path in terms of payment structure. Again, every payment method has them. It's a question of balancing and mitigating adverse consequences uh, by using either complementary financial incentives or other mechanisms. And um, that brings me to another key point, which is that we know in theory and in practice that mixed payment systems dominate any extremes. Economists are actually extremely moderate people. Perhaps you don't know any, but we like the middle ground. Uh, there's nothing nothing uh, good in the corner solutions. And so um, when I start talking about my spectrum of payment models, uh, you, I'll talk about sort of each individual approach separately. But we really think that the best approach is to use some combination of mechanisms without too much emphasis on one or another, some balanced set of financial incentives again, in a larger context where we have a balanced set of other mechanisms to ensure minimal adverse consequences, maximal effectiveness. Uh, fourth, there is terrific evidence that the, there's not going to be a single payment model for every provider, for every context. There'll be uh, small critical access rural hospitals that will require a different payment approach than the large urban academic medical center capabilities, the ability to pool risk, to manage risk, all of these things are going to determine the appropriate payment approach. So a one-size-fits-all notion really is unlikely to be optimal. And, um, and along those same lines that we really need to think about the context for financial incentives uh, in, the larger, in the larger context now. Um, in the US, for example, We've been spending a lot of time on primary care reform that I'll tell you a little bit about today. And, um, and one of the goals of those primary care reforms is to reduce the use of the emergency department and the inpatient setting. And, uh, and you know, at the same time, many insurers require co-payments for primary care visits that are not that much lower than emergency department co-payments. So we're working really hard to encourage primary care physicians to open access, to extend their hours, to discourage emergency department use, and yet the patient incentives are misaligned. Uh, so uh, just finally, I want to acknowledge uh, that the literature on the use of financial incentives uh, is replete with null results. There's a, a recent review that maybe you've seen, a Cochrane review that came out last year that basically said, Nothing matters when it comes to paying primary care physicians. There are, there are an infinite number of ways of screwing it up, basically, as far as I can tell. And so uh, this does not really contradict the theory. It's not that I'm stubborn, but uh, if you look at, at policies, uh, they don't just come out of thin air. They come out of a context of market power, of the usual political economy that determines payment approaches. Uh, and it, it really is about design and implementation. Uh, there are better and worse payment models, but there are lots of ways of implementing better payment models in ways that essentially um, 
deplete them of their power. And, and I think, you know, a good example, in my view, is looking at the general practitioner contract in the NHS that was implemented in 2004. Uh, lots of, lots of stuff to love there as a health economist. Pretty robust incentives, uh, good quality measures. This was a pay for performance contract. Um, and yet, uh, it had very little effect on the quality of primary care in the UK because the thresholds were set so low as to essentially remove any incentive to improve. So here's my spectrum of provider payment, uh, and I've taken a great deal of liberty with it, so I hope you'll forgive me. Tried to put it on one spectrum. But I think of us in the US as really starting on the left where we tend to pay for units of service for everything. So that means fee schedules for ambulatory care for physicians. Uh, and, uh, and it means for us in the inpatient context, we use DRG payments, so diagnosis-related groups. So we pay for every admission. It's not exactly cost-based, but we still pay in silos. And, uh, and the more you do, the more you get. And then moving to the right, I, I'm thinking of this in terms of a spectrum of accountability for us. And so um, moving a little bit to the right, we're taking that fee-for-service schedule that just says basically we want you to deliver a test and then um, add to that, we'd like it to be the right test. And we're going to actually pay more if you do routine hemoglobin A1C testing for your diabetic patients. And so it's a little bit further down the spectrum of it's not enough just to do stuff. You need to do stuff that's evidence-based. Further to the right, some U.S. payers, including Medicare, and I'll, I'll show you what they've been doing, have been trying to get to the other side of pay for performance, which is to not pay for preventable complications, to, for the costs of preventable complications. Uh, a little bit broader, I put uh, towards the right in the red box, mixed payment. Uh, we've largely seen the, uh, the advent of mixed payment in the primary care context, very similar to a lot of Western Europe, where primary care physicians are being paid uh, at least about a third to a half of their salaries on a capitation basis, so for enrolling patients, and then fee-for-service on top of that, um, and uh, possibly the use of pay-for-performance there, too. So that's truly a mixed payment, capitation, fee-for-service, pay-for-performance. Uh, and then there's a great deal of interest in episode-based payment. In the U.S. context, that's uh, meant one of two things. One is bundling both the physician services and the hospital services around an acute, largely procedure-based inpatient episode. So right now we pay the hospital one thing, we pay the doctor something else, and then there's post-acute care. So we're trying to put all of those pieces together to encourage greater efficiencies and alignment. Uh, one, one of the big places where we have misalignment is between doctors who are treating patients in the inpatient context and the facilities. There's, they don't talk to one another culturally. There's a lot of animosity between hospitals and the physicians who practice there. And incentive-wise, there's a big disconnect. And it's very, very hard, for example, to get the surgeons on board uh, to improve care in the hospital setting, in part because it requires time and effort and if the hospital is, uh, has a patient safety program, they can't pay the surgeons to really participate in that. That's a violation of, uh, of some conflict laws in the U.S. So there's a great deal of misalignment there that episode-based payment is trying to address. The, the second context where episode-based payment uh, is being looked at is really uh, for chronic conditions, given that patients with many chronic conditions in particular see a lot of different providers. The notion there is that there's a lot of fragmentation opportunity for better coordination if there were a single bucket of payment. That is uh, going on in a few experiments in the US. The Netherlands has really taken off on this idea. And then finally, global payment to the right, uh, thinking about global budgets, which I, I understand in many parts of the world are typical of hospital payment. We have very little of that in the US. We've had some global budgets for everything else, and, and in some places, global capitation for total cost of care. But that has been quite, uh, quite the focus, particularly for federal payment reforms. So let me just drill down to a couple of um, pieces of information about what we've experienced in the US that may be of some interest to you. Um, 
because pay for performance has been around for a great deal of time, you probably already know all of this, but about 10, 10 years ago, the Institute of Medicine, which is a quasi-governmental body in the US that, that opines on all things healthcare, uh, decided to put out this report on the quality of care in the US and, and basically shows what everyone um, everyone other than um, uh, than the folks in Washington seem to know, which is that the U.S. healthcare system is the most expensive and the than the um, the least effective healthcare system in the world. Uh, and uh, a lot of the quality problems identified by the Institute of Medicine could be traced to poor financial incentives. Not all of them, by any means, and and these problems are much more complicated. But one of the implications of the report was that payers in the U.S. needed to a be do a better job of aligning incentives. Uh, and so pay for performance really took off around then. And uh, we had a, a rich literature really grow up. And uh, overall, the findings of that literature look a lot like that primary care Cochrane review I mentioned to you. Very unimpressive. Uh, our, uh, our performance with pay for performance has yielded very little in the way of quality improvement. Now, most of these programs are relatively small. For physicians, they were bonuses related to some of these evidence-based processes of care, but relatively narrowly defined, and therefore relatively little money on the table. For hospitals, the measures were a bit broader, included outcome measures, including risk-adjusted mortality rates. But again, the dollars have been relatively modest. Uh, and so my takeaway from this literature, with which I'm particularly familiar, is that implementation can account for much of the lackluster results that we see. In particular, the use of thresholds that are either too high, meaning no one can attain them, so why bother trying, or too low, meaning you're already there, so why pick up your pace? Um, so moving on to the non-payment for preventable complications, this is really, I would say, the theme of US payment reform right now is trying to trying to ascertain and assign accountability for c unnecessary costs. So unnecessary costs might be waste, uh, but uh, in particular, we've really started with complications and trying to identify who could have prevented the complication and figure out how to generate a financial incentive around that. So this is in the hospital context, Medicare pays, as I mentioned before, based on these diagnosis-related groups per discharge. And these are severity adjusted, risk adjusted. These, this list of complications here uh, is a set of complications that Medicare said, um, we're no longer going to pay you more if patients have these things happen to them. It used to be that if one of these was coded in the claims data, that the hospital will get more for that admission. Uh, let's say the primary diagnosis uh, was pneumonia and the patient had a pressure ulcer or a, a UTI they would get more, the hospital would get more. And so now, um, that's no longer true. And this is really the beginning. Th these in of themselves have a very modest effect on hospital payments. But it's really the start of a conversation about what is preventable and um, trying to align incentives to achieve these health system goals. Uh, very briefly, patient-centered medical homes, moving along my spectrum towards mixed payment for primary care, and I understand that uh, family health care teams here um, or in Ontario and, and there are similar models here in Quebec um, are also part of the reform scheme here. This is, this is about clinically improving primary care, changing the model of primary care, but it very much has a, a payment complement to it. So this, I think, is a really good example of where financial incentives need to mesh with organizational capabilities and everything else that's going on in the delivery system. We're, on the one hand, investing in uh, information technology, healthcare teams, all of the tools for primary care, and at the same time delivering a payment method, part capitation, part fee-for-service, a little bit of pay-for-performance that is consistent with delivering that kind of primary care that isn't just a face-to-face -face office visit. If all you can bill for is having the patient in front of you, you can't really deliver continuous, coordinated, good primary care. 
And then finally, accountable care organizations. I mentioned global payment is really all the rage in the US. We are trying to be like the rest of the OECD while you guys are moving in the other direction. Uh, and, uh, and our big question is, where do we put that global budget? Uh, the notion now is to find some kind of entity, not just a hospital, but a larger integrated system, perhaps a hospital in partnership with a physician organization, assign accountability to that entity for a global budget, track quality measures, track access, and use pay for performance in effect to reward not just cost control, which is our primary concern these days in the US, uh, but also maintenance and improvement of quality and access. Uh, there's a lot of debate about how this is gonna work, and, uh, and these, these ideas are very complicated. The implementation will be very challenging, but many of these accountable care organizations are being rolled out right now. Medicare is now paying hundreds of these accountable care organizations at the back end. They'll be rewarded essentially for savings um, as opposed to being actually paid prospectively. So I think I'm out of time, um, but you know I should note that there, there is no escaping financial incentives in healthcare. You may hate them, uh, but the fact of the matter is we pay healthcare providers. And, um, and so no matter how you do it, you generate a financial incentive. Uh, it's gonna be important to think about trying to do that uh, at least uh, to do no harm. Uh, mixed payment methodologies are likely to be best among financial incentives, but a mixed approach to attaining health policy goals that balances some consumer forces with these direct financial incentives with other kinds of regulatory mechanisms is also likely to be best rather than relying too much on financial incentives or, uh, or relying too much on other mechanisms. Uh, in general, I think it's important to keep in mind that implementation execution is really gonna matter, and I hope that some of the other speakers will get you closer to the ground on that issue. Thank you. <laughs>